the bench episode three uncle greg how you doing? hi how you doing man i'm doing good how you doing buddy you you're you're doing better than me <laughs> how is that even possible how is that even possible since, since i've seen you last you're backstage with ace Frehley for two minutes yeah um and then you you got to hang out with uh an old friend of yours. Yeah, Joe, little Joey. Little little Joey Bonamassa. <laughs> <laughs> little Joey Bonamassa. You, you know you you've known him forever? Well, not not forever, but since he was like 15. That's forever 14. enough. Yeah. Yeah, his um his dad and he used to set up at the Philly Vintage Guitar Shows mm -hmm. and uh so uh we did some business back and forth and mm -hmm. um so I I knew Joe when he was a kid and uh um, and I didn't see him for 15 years. And then I ran into him out in, out in LA and he was a big star and, uh, it was really kind of cool. Cause he's always, he's, he's Joey to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he's, he's, it's <sighs> the interesting thing about Joe is when you're looking at him up on stage, he's got the glasses, the slick back hair, the fancy suit, and he looks like he's 50 years old, but backstage we're sitting in, in the, in the dressing room now. This was at the Hershey Theater, mm -hmm. and the Hershey Theater is a is a very old building, and the dressing rooms are small. And he got one of the premium dressing rooms, which has an attached bathroom. Mm -hmm. So I walk into the dressing room, and he's just sitting there, in front of the lighted mirror, just dressed like your average Joe. Yeah, average I'm Joe. There. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and he's holding a 1960 Gibson Les Paul Sunburst, uh, which is not average. I was gonna say, it's like... yeah. And there's a cord and it goes underneath the, the door into the bathroom. And I said, Hey man, he goes, Hey man. And he goes, bloop, bloop, bloop. and he's got a little amp in the bathtub. There's like a bathtub shower sort of thing. You know, it's all antique porcelain and everything sounded righteous. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, hung out and he handed me the guitar and I fooled around with it. It's a really cool thing though, because it's a 1960 Gibson Les Paul sunburst worth an awful lot of money. And a, a good friend of his gave it to him to take out on this tour and they're running around doing the tour and then it's going to be raffled off uh, for veterans affairs. All right. Wonderful. So 100% of the proceeds are going to go for us veterans, which I think is a great idea. Absolutely. I'm a huge supporter of veterans rights. Yeah. As, as we all are, as we all are, as we all should be. All right. I know people that say, Oh, once you sign up, you no, 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 no. I get to look like this because guys did what they did. I get to get up in the morning and do what I want to do because people gave their lives so that I could do that. Yeah. yeah. So, so Joe backstage, he's what, what's his backstage routine? It's a, uh, he's just, you know, just, he's always got a guitar in his hands. Okay. And uh, so, you know, you just got to make sure you can hear him over the amp. That's all. And uh, we just hung out, and uh, and Ben Brandt was there, and uh, there's a player, Ben Brandt, hell of a guitar player. Yeah. And uh, Soul Miners so, Union. Repeat. Soul Miners Union. Soul Miners Union. Yep. Harrisburg, PA. Look them up. Yeah. Killer band. Killer band. But uh, so yeah, so me and uh, I mean Joe and Ben, uh, me and Joe and Ben, Joe, Ben, and I are hanging out in the in the dressing room, just you know, shooting shit and talking about guitars and. You know, we're just guitar guys. I, I I touched on this in episode one. You know, famous people are there's they, they still put their pants on one leg at a time. And if you treat famous people like people, then they want to do the what same. Is, thing. What is what is cropped up is uh this picture of Ben Brandt playing through Joe's rig. Yeah. And you look over his shoulder and it's like Papa Papa Joe looking over his shoulder. Uh, yeah, I wasn't there for that. I was, yeah, I was yeah. stuffing the electronics back into an old Gibson. Yeah, yelling, screaming, and throwing things. Yeah. Uh, if you go to my uh, my media, you'll see the pictures, and and you'll. Yeah. I was asking people to pray for me, and I was being serious. Um, it was putting uh, ES. It was an ES three thirty five that had been sent back to the factory in three forty five electronics with Veritone were installed in this guitar. And there's basically 10 pounds of shit in a seven pound bag yeah. and it has to go in in a particular order. Mm -hmm. You don't just stuff that stuff in there. Yeah. 
yeah. like on a on a regular guitar like this is a bass but you know you have the pickup and then you have channels and then you have a control cavity and all that stuff yeah um on a 335 it, everything goes in through the bridge pickup hole and if you're lucky you can kind of manipulate your fingers through the f hole and get this and that whatever but um what i had to do where do i where did i throw it <laughs> i don't know where i threw this stuff but essentially i i, I cut pieces of, of of oh here we go i cut these pieces of wire and soldered them to the tops of all the potentiometers and then took the whole thing out so i had all this wire coming out through the hole and then um did all the repairing that i had to do there's a bunch of bad solder joints the switch wasn't working whatever did all that and then it's like like a marionette pulling all these strings back down through one at a time trying to get each component to line up yeah. and when you're dealing with 40 year old wire yeah it you know the plastic wire the, the cloth wire in those things <clears throat> this is this is um pushback wire this is is the wire that's used in in vintage gibsons and it's basically cloth covered wire yeah. with a, a braid on the outside of it all right and the braid is the shield and so this is two conductor pushback and that's <clears throat> what gibson used running from their pickups to the electronics and then around the electronics and to the output jack and that's all good um this basically is right as rain and, and as as long as it it doesn't get really, really wet and and, and uh, oxidized. It's, It'll last it's forever. still relatively flexible. Yeah. But uh, uh, stalling for time. The plastic wire that they used for the a veritone is basically a bunch of capacitors with a five-way switch. And what you do is you start with no capacitors brought into the circuit and then you keep turning the switch and with each click the tone gets worse and whoever designed that was that like the paul reed smith no no with prs you're selecting coils it makes sense okay but a veritone yeah is just adding more and more resistance to the circuit and taking out more and more bass so eventually it just sounds like the guitar is 500 yards away in a train tunnel it, it, it's a it's stupid and I, you know it's stupid and the thing is, the plastic covered wire stops being flexible after 10 years. Yeah. So, and if you break one of the wires, then you got to disassemble all these components to rerun wire. Yeah. And uh, so let's just old say. Does the wire still exist? Is that still a technology? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Does the old wire still exist? Is that a technology that is still. No, no, you have, have to. You have to uh, replace it with, with newer stuff. The technology of making stranded wire is still exactly the same as it was then. Yeah. It's just that the plastic that they used in 1969 uh, is no longer flexible. Okay. So okay. this is one of my replacement pieces that uh, wasn't long enough. So I had to make another one. But, uh, but this gives you an idea. Um, yeah. Imagine if I went like this and it sprayed plastic everywhere. That was the stuff coming out of the guitar. Yeah. So I was not happy. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so I went over and hung out. Ben got to play through the rig and uh, the rig. Um, okay, explain the rig. The rig was like uh, it was a biamping rig. Oh, it was like quint quint rig. I mean, bi is only two. Yeah, he had yeah. like five different amps. He had a couple of uh, dumbbells, an overdriver, overdrive special, and a six string singer. I think. Um, he had, uh, and again, if you put a link on this to my pictures from last night, um, people can look. Uh, he had his main Marshall Jubilee, which is a Canadian one, um, and then a USA Silver Jubilee. That was in 1987. It was 2550 uh, uh, years of, of Marshall amps. 50 years of Marshall amps, 25 in the United States. I don't know. I don't know how it worked out. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Um, and then uh, a couple of uh, Fender uh, Tweed twins and everything with baffles in front. And the cool thing was he had a Mesa Boogie Leslie, which was the rarest amp of all amps up there. I, I've, I've never even seen one in the flesh. Okay. And good Lord, did that sound good. Um, 
and uh, I took a shot of his pedal board and you can see his, his amp switching and everything. And, you yeah. know, where some guys might add or subtract a pedal, he changes amps completely. Yeah. Um, and the best tone that he had was the silver Jubilee and the uh, Dumble overdrive special together that was his, that was the lead time i gotta be honest with you i didn't know how much of a kind of a tone ranger like he was i oh, yeah. he kind of like there's a there's a strong for lack of a better person to compare him to eric johnson yes yeah in fact um, i didn't know on his records you can't necessarily tell that he is that that he is that like much of an artist when it comes to his tones no, and, and and that's one of the cool things is he's one of those guys. Vi is one of those guys. Um, Paul Gilbert, these guys where not only do they change pickups on the guitars and change pedals, but actually they'll change amp sounds. And um, you can leave your guitar on the bridge pickup and go from a, a Tweed Fender Twin from 1959 to a 1987 Marshall Jubilee, and there's a pronounced difference in tone. Um, and he's Joe's really good at, at blending between the subtleties um, of the different things. And when you stand there in front of his rig and you hear it, um, it's even more um, obvious than, you know, once it goes through the PA, you know, the signal chain is so, mm -hmm. you know, modified. And then it goes through the speakers that basically, and then it's got to blast across all the hairspray until it gets to you. So, um, but when you're standing in front of this stuff, there's a there's a visceral sensation between the different uh, the different amps, if that's a proper way of putting that. Yeah. But uh, tangible, yeah, there's tangible sensation where and uh, uh, there's an interaction between the amps and the guitars that's different. Whether you're playing through a you know a Marshall through a closed back cabinet or a vintage Tweed Twin, which is open back. And I didn't know um, how many Marshalls he had either. Four. Uh, yeah. the main one, the Canadian one, the, they were an interesting thing. <clears throat> and everybody, here's a tone secret if you're ready. In Canada, their UL, their underwriters laboratory, the, the regulatory committee that they have that regulates electronics. I don't know if they've changed it, but it used to be the on off switch and the pilot lamp had to be separate. On most Marshalls, since the JMP series, all the JCM 800s, and since then, um, they have a lighted a red lighted switch for the on off and then a black switch for the standby. Well, on the Canadian ones, there's a on off switch and a standby and a pilot light. So they use a much heavier duty component. And then the transformers on the Canadian ones uh, are lay down transformers. They're, they're Drake transformers, same ones as, as uh, same company as the ones for the United States market, excuse me, but they, they're lay down transformers and a transformer that's laying on its side has, has a, a different reaction to the chassis and to the components and everything like that. So in general, um, Joe and I, and, and several other people believe that the Canadian amps, um, all things being equal, which is almost impossible with tube amps, but yeah. averaging out the component drift, on the Canadian amps have a better tone. Okay. And uh, um, so that lead tone that you heard last night. Like, uh, like uh, batteries on his. Uh... No, no. He doesn't, he doesn't know Eric Johnson, the battery thing. And, and actually having met Eric Johnson, I can tell you, he might be able to tell yeah, the difference I between. I that he can. I mean, he, he really is a next level sort of person but yeah. uh um no i think <clears throat> i was a marshall dealer for a long time when i had bcr music mm -hmm. and let's say we got four amps in a row mm -hmm. um they all had subtle voicing differences because you got to figure with with something made out of circuit boards <coughs> tolerances are really tight but when you have a hand wired amp using big, ugly components in there, uh, you might have a, let's say a plus or minus quality control of 5%. Mm -hmm. Well, if you get a bunch of plus fives on an amp, you're going to have a great amp. If you get a bunch of minus fives on an amp, you're going to have a not so great amp, or you might actually, that might even be better yet. 
you know, you don't know. Yeah. Um, so when you have, when you don't have uh, 100% control over the components, when the comp components vary a little bit, there's going to be, there's going to be right. something different. Very the irony right. is that I am shedding all tube amplifiers and going Kemper uh, because with the Kemper, uh, it profiles. What you do with a Kemper is you put mics in front of an amp and you play a very particular sequence of, of, of things and, and the Kemper mm -hmm. learns how that amp works. So you turn the volume up and down and everything like that. And then you store that. And then anytime you recall that, it reacts to the input signal exactly as the amp did. Yeah. Now, this is not modeling. Understand, like line six amp farm. Um, you remember Johnson, the first modeling amp? Um, those, you're asking a computer to simulate the tone of an amp. And um, I can't tell you how many times down through the years somebody would, would uh, bring in a line six product and put it on the AC30 setting and say, see, I sound just like Brian May. And I'd have a real AC30 right there and I'd plug them into it and they go, oh my God, that's so different. It's, yeah, because it's a computer. Um, and so I really wasn't interested in the, in the, the profiling. Yeah. Um, I have a few of my clients, uh, I'm gonna try to not name drop because somebody called me on that. They said, Greg, you're spitting names like a rapper. But um, somebody very, very famous uh, had a Kemper a bunch of years ago. And they said, man, you got to you got to try this thing. I'm like, I'm not interested. I, I don't want I like I like amps. And he goes, yeah, OK, whatever. You know, this works. Well, a few years ago, um, I'll drop this name because most of the people watching won't know this name. Uh, there's a fellow named Brian Baker. And uh, back in the day, he was uh, in a minor threat. OK. DC and then he ended up in junkyard out in LA All right. and did a fantastic record. And it was during the hairband era, junkyard came out. They got lumped in with hairband, but they were North Hollywood, like skate punk, hard rock. You know, they weren't glam. Um, you know, you wouldn't see like Brian Baker and Ricky Rocket, you know, standing beside each other, flyering. Rockman. Yeah. Um, but Brian favors 1950s gibson les paul juniors and i do his work for him and i was working on yet another junior for him and i said and he was living in dc at the time he's, he's in jersey now and uh, i said so are you still using those old marshall plexis uh to run through and he goes well in a manner of speaking and i said what do you mean he said well i have a kemper profiler and uh, i profiled those amps and now i sound exactly the same on all four continents and i i that's when I decided to look into it and about that time, uh, my girlfriend, Sarah Sheriff, uh, is, she does praise and worship music. She plays at our church, uh, Carlisle Evangelical Free Church. And a lot of the modern contemporary praise and worship uh, musicians use Kempers. Mm -hmm. And so she got into that, became very good friends with Michael Britt, who was the guy for yeah, yeah. Kemper profiles. And uh, so uh, she's She's a national expert on Kemper. So uh, I became, yeah, I became a Kemper dealer at my I, shop and I, I got my stuff. On. I bought, I bought one myself because of our discussions. Oh, it's, it's a, recording for recording purposes. I'm, you know, there's nothing better for recording. There's absolutely nothing, that but you'd be those, surprised. That is, one, that is one of those little um, pieces of gear that, you know, the, you know, the Rick Beato room, it has uh, the hundred amplifiers. Yeah, I don't have that kind of money. No, but you can do exactly that, yeah, and you don't have to carry all that shit. Temper, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's so crazy to think that you know, in a, in, in a Kemper, you can have all the amps that Joe had up on stage last night at your disposal. And the cool thing about the Kemper is you can change your input gain on a on a vintage Fender Twin, which just had a volume control. You had to turn it up to stun to get that tone. I have a 59 basement that's beat to crap. Uh, it's it's so ugly, it's beautiful. And it sounds amazing at one spot on the volume dial, which is eight. And uh, when it's running, you know, at a lower volume, it's a great bass amp. But for a guitar amp, you got to drive it out. But when you do, oh, it's glorious. Well, I'm profiling that thing. 
and then I can get that sound at any level. And if I want, I can bump up the input gain. I can pull a little of the mids out. I can add a little bit of presence. You know, all these neat controls now work. And then the really cool thing about the Kemper is all the good pedals are in there as well. Your whole signal chain is in this box. And uh, um, I do work for Slaughter and Mark Slaughter uses the Kemper. He does something cool. He has a wah that he likes. So he runs through his wah and, a, and an overdrive and then into the front of his Kemper. And uh, um, I can't talk to you right now. Sorry about that. Um, but he runs into into a little pedal board and then into the front of his camper. So he's got the familiarity of the wah, yeah. even though there is a great wah in the camper. He's got the one he wants to use and it works great. So um, this is not a camper ad, folks. I'm not being paid yeah. by camper to talk about it. It oh. just works. It's yeah. the camper profiler works. So, um, I have the I have the toaster with uh, with Same 600 here. watt amp in it so I can run a 412 if I want or a single 12 or whatever. And um, odds are, if you see me playing with an electric guitar, uh, look behind me and you'll see the little glittering lights of the Kemper and uh, sitting on top of I'm whatever camera I have. Using it live. Say again? I'm a long way before using it live. That's that's another step of a... Yeah. You have the foot unit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have the footboard and everything. Yeah. And uh, there's a company called Mission that makes uh, the best interactive volume and walk control. And the cool thing is one pedal can be either. Um, you just, you assign it. And uh, it's just crazy. It's got an unbelievable strobe tuner in it. Um, uh, it pretty much does everything but wash your car. Yeah. Um, I, I hear that's going to happen. Yes. So. so last night, just reiteration, I never saw the guy live before. Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. So the stuff that he was doing, he pulled out that theremin. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> To yeah, those that, that don't know what a theremin the other is. Another thing. Josh Smith was his backup guitar player. Josh Smith was guitar too. Unbelievable. Yeah. Josh Smith is such a brilliant player and he's guitar too. Yeah. Oh. What, 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 now, I will tell you this. I will absolutely. Reese Winans on piano, yeah. on keyboards. Yeah. Reese Winans. Yeah. His band is so freaking good. And if he didn't show up, Josh could have done it. Josh is, he even introduced Josh as the best guitar player on, on stage. stage. Yes. Now, oh my God. for that reason, when I say this, whatever it's worth, for this old uh, dude in PA, I will always back somebody who states it like, I don't know, he gave props to his, his best friend in the world. And it's like, him as a dude is totally cool. Yeah, he's so gracious. Yeah, because you know, he introduced we all everybody. Get, we all get sick of the guitar, the 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 the, the, the ego guitar player that think they're the whatever. I was like that 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 kind of energy is draining. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Joe's energy is absolutely wonderful. And it, it's yeah, like, Joe's not angry. Uh, yeah. Actually, I was talking to Phil X yesterday. He's uh, he's going to be opening up for Engve at H Mac when uh, when Engve comes through. So uh, you're okay, going to want to be there. See, I'll go to see Phil X. Oh my God. Just one of the most brilliant guitar players. And he's a friggin' riot. He's literally walking off stage with Bon Jovi and 20 hours later opening up for in, in Nashville and 20 hours later opening up for Engve in New Hampshire or Connecticut or something. And then a day or two later coming then um to to Harrisburg. So uh no um, to somebody to watch. I did Engve. Engve, if you've never seen Engve. Well, Somebody you know, else, you got to go see Engve once. Yeah. Um, he is really, he, he's, he's ridiculously talented. Um, and he's very flamboyant. He's, he's an excellent showman. Mm -hmm. But does he need 42 Marshall cabinets and 300 Marshall amplifiers stacked up behind him? Um, how many, that's how many weird. Of those are, how many of those are actual usable speakers? You didn't say it, so you're not in trouble. <laughs> that was insanity. That's insanity, though. If it would be anything more than that, that's absolutely nuts. Now, it, it, it bears being said. I, right I saw now. him at Metron like 25 years ago or whatever. Yeah, I was there, too. Yeah, yeah it was good. I didn't see you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get the same show. You were backstage. That's why. 
Did you ever see the couch backstage at the Metron? No. No. I'm... Oh, yeah. That's because you don't get backstage. <laughs> Let, we, we, that's, a, that's a different conversation for a different time. They would close at night, and the couch would be against the north wall. They'd open the next morning. The couch was against the south wall. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. All right. But, uh, no, Engve. You know, like we're, I, I'm being a little snide about Engve here because I, I really I'm not a big fan, but the people that love him, um, they will really get their money's worth because you know they're going to plunk down their hard earned money and 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 they're going to stand there and they're going to be wildly entertained by a guy that's very very good at what he does. Yes, and I was just I don't have to agree about- with. Go ahead. I was just talking about somebody about being a, a jack of all trades or a master of one. He is a master mm. of one. He does his yeah. really, really, and that's all he's ever cared to do. Yeah, and there's other guys that can play just like him, but he did it. You know, there, like we we said about Eddie about the tapping. Tapping was around for a long time, but Eddie made tapping what it is. And um, I, after all these years of being involved in guitars, um, I will be listening to earl clue uh k-l-u-g-h uh earl clue is a nylon string pop guitar player excuse me and he's he's wonderful and and one of my hard rock guys will come in here to drop off a guitar pick up a guitar and go what is that crap you're listening to but to me it's not crap Mm -mm. and so uh to everybody in the audience at the engve show they're you know they're gonna see a guy that does what he does really well to everybody last night at the bonamassa show they saw a guy that's really good at what he does. And that's the beautiful thing about being, a, uh, being alive right now is there's so many different types of music. So, and, and it's, it's being delivered so well by so many people. So, you know, if, the different if, combinations, what I g- got gathered from Bonamassa just by listening is the number of people that crossed his sphere of influence that he was inspired by, that he borrowed a little of this, a little of that from. Right. I heard a little Ingve in there. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I like Joey Eric Johnson. Joey was in a band called Bloodline with a bunch of you know kids of famous people when he was oh, a kid. Joe. And uh, you know, I, I remember hearing him and stuff, and, and it'd be like you'd hear the Albert King licks, and then he would shift to Freddie King in the same song, and then you'd hear a little, little Eric Johnson or whatever. Now Joe is Joe, and he sounds like Joe, yeah. and we are all made up of building blocks that we've picked up you know here and there and and uh you know if 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 any of us are lucky there's something about us that's identifiable with it the next time somebody hears something like that they'll say oh that sounds like so and so and um so uh essentially joe has become he he now has a very identifiable style but he does not hide his influences and that's what i like and i mean apologize no, like the Eric Johnson singing violin tone yeah. and stuff, you know. He does not apologize. And it's like, he, one of the things he said that I, I found fault with was that he is a, uh, he is a controversial music figure. And it's a controversial among people that are jealous of you is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> For me, yeah. that's I what mean, I'm saying because what we need the world i don't i don't want to say the world needs more of him no the world has one joe one joe's enough yeah one joe's enough but yeah, the, the beautiful thing is that, that he does what he does and that, that yeah joe's there i mean um you know you get a guy like david grissom uh grissom is a prs artist uh he has a dgt the david grissom trim model mm-hmm. uh played with storyville which was steve ray vaughn's band backup band yep after stevie passed away uh he played with uh, melon camp for yeah. years and years and years um i think jack and diane forward is, is david grissom on lead guitar um absolutely mind-blowing guitar player uh really 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 gracious and 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 giving fella very quiet and stuff like that picks up a guitar lays everybody to waste um he doesn't have the footprint joe has uh and there are those that would say, well, if, if somebody like Grissom is not a huge star, then the world isn't fair. No, no, it's more than just being able to play. You, you have to be able to do things. The, the cool thing about Joe was uh, his G string went flat on that 1959 burst. And while he was playing a lead, he tuned the guitar. Yeah, That's cool. 
That's absolutely you know? cool. I don't and need then to he do my own joke car. about it. Yeah. <laughs> then he joked about it. I mean, yeah. most guys would be so embarrassed, like, oh shit, my guitar went out of tune in front of you know however many people. He's like, Oh, yeah, how about that? That was kind of you know, his his demeanor was really, really good. Yeah. Um, he deserves to be where he is. Yeah, He's worked very, very hard. God bless him. Yeah, whenever no? I hear anything the contrary, I just like that, that's that's more on the person. Well, well, yeah, I mean, we're all guilty of, you know, and I may have crossed the line talking about envy a little early. Who knows? You know, we're all guilty of 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 wearing our biases where yeah. people can see them. And, uh, um, you know, the bottom line is when it's all said and done, if you didn't hurt anybody today, yeah, it's a good day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he totally. In- Totally inspired so many people, I'm sure. Absolutely. Myself included, obviously. So that theremin. Yes, that theremin. For those that don't know what a theremin is, it's this odd instrument that has an antenna. And the antenna has a force field around an electromagnetic field. And then as you get closer, it makes a weird noise. And as you go up and down this way, the pitch changes. And as you go back and forth, the amplitude or volume changes and the gain structure. So it might be... They used to use it in the old, 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 uh, the old movies before there was a. Uh, they were movies. They were uh, these theremin players in the in, in, in the movie houses when they were when you had backup bands doing yeah doing sound effects yes and uh, Led Zeppelin. I mean, whole lot of love. That's that's all. That's all theremin. That weird yeah. crap that you hear. It's Jimmy Page in front of a theremin. So you know, Google theremin and you'll yes. see what it was. And I was really surprised to see that when I got there last night and. I'm, Friggin' theremin on stage and no opener. I didn't know what was going on. And when Joe went over and started messing around with it and he was good at it, I thought, man, there's another thing I, I'll never be able to do that he can do. <laughs> so, yeah, Les Pauls, Strats, Telecasters, yeah. everything. Yeah. Uh, yes. The- uh, I'll tell you what, the SG that he started with, it was actually a 1960 ink stamped serial number less paul standard that was a changeover because in 61 the less paul that we know the maple top single cutaway was gone they replaced it with that guitar and then less had an argument with gibson he was no longer selling records they took his name off and went with the working title which was solid guitar sg um the interesting thing is joe was telling me last night that he has a single cut sunburst with a later serial number than that particular guitar and when he handed it to me three things surprised me about it number one the the cherry color was so incredibly strong and it's not refined it's that guitar has not seen a lot of sunlight number two it's fairly heavy um for an sg it's still lighter than a than a les paul uh, a single cut uh and number three the tone of that thing good lord did that thing sound good the whole night was oh yeah every one of those guitars was chosen for a very particular purpose and every one of those guitars sounded amazing artistry artistry yeah. thank you greg thank you greg i will see I don't you know. in seven days we're out of time yeah well, i'll see you next week everybody be uh who are we, who are we good. Talk about next week <laughs> we're going to talk about one of the things we're going to talk about is how to string your guitar and how to keep your guitar in tune i have a that lot of people that ask me about that in the lobby last night, this guy told me that his guitar wouldn't stay in tune. And, and I said, stretch the strings. He goes, what? So he wasn't even aware of that. So we'll talk about that next week. All righty. All righty. See you, everybody. Next week. Right. God bless y'all.